We're here today with Dr. Peter Remensberger, who is the director of the Neonatal and Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at the University Hospital in Geneva, Switzerland. Dr. Remensberger is now picking up on part two of his first discussion. In the first discussion, as you remember, we were talking about the concepts of peak inspiratory pressure and tidal volume. And as we last left the presentation, we were discussing how Dr. Remensberger manages a patient who has normal compliance and those conditions where the patient has low lung compliance and how he adjusts tidal volumes in those two different conditions. Today, we're going to ask Dr. Remensberger to explore with us the concept of PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, and how he adjusts from there. Peter, welcome. Welcome, Joe. So, uh, we the last time we discussed how to adjust tidal volumes within a different kind of disease or different degrees of disease. And I just try to stress out that the patient uh, respiratory compliance is an important factor in trying to dial in your correct or allowable tidal volume. Remembering that when we have severe lung injury or restrictive lung disease, that small tidal volumes might be more appropriate than the classical saying of six mil per kilogram. And with this, that you should end up in the beginning with relatively low plateau pressures. In such situations, you may then occur the problem that you have an oxygenation problem. And the oxygenation problem indicates that there is intrapulmonary shunt. If you have intrapulmonary shunt, you have to talk about how to use PEEP and how to titrate PEEP. So let's have a look at PEEP, at what PEEP means in terms of lung volumes, intrapulmonary shunt reduction and oxygenation improvement. If you go back to uh, Matami's work in chest in 1984, actually they could show that increasing PEEP in patients with ARDS all of a sudden led to an improvement in oxygenation and vice versa reduction of intrapulmonary shunt. This could then uh, also be shown in different studies that were followed uh, later on. And just to remember what we had to learn from there on is that somewhere we have some kind of a lung opening when we turn up PEEP. And by turning up, do not forget, you turn also up your plateau pressure if you're in volume control or your positive end inspiratory pressure if you're in a pressure control mode. And we had to learn that we have to set a reasonable tidal volume in between the area where we consider that the atelectroma may occur or volatroma may occur. As you can see here, a lung is opening at relatively high pressures only, so where you have a change in the inflection of the pressure volume curve, and then very fast open up and will we reach very fast also the risk of over distension, over distending this lung. We'd like to turn now to our colleagues around the world and ask you a question. Please, in your answer, first state your city and country location. The question is, in patients who are struggling with poor oxygenation, at what FiO2 do you consider increasing the PEEP level? When we look now at the major studies that have been uh, published in terms of PEEP trials, so after the ARDS network trial comparing 6 versus 12 mil per kilo, there were several uh, people trying uh, to compare different PEEP titration schemes, means uh, using an FIU2 as an indicator or marker when they had to uh, increase the PEEP. And there was the ARDS network trial, the Algola trial, the LAFS trial. Let's have a look at those. So all these trials actually were ending up with negative results, which means no difference between the control and the higher PEEP group. And we can look a little bit at this and take numbers out then you could almost say if your patient is 50% of oxygen, you can choose either a PEEP of 8 or 18 and you shouldn't do much harm. This is what studies like this could uh, show you. However, there are certain situations where we do not have a clear answer with one controlled single randomized controlled trial, we're trying to get meta-analysis. And in this situation, again, PEEP in meta-analysis, there were two uh, studies coming out, one in 2009, the other one in 2010. Interestingly, if you look at the numbers where they started from identified trials that could be included, there was a huge difference between the uh, Phoenix trial in 2009 
and the Braille trial in 2010. And when you look then down and see what find of what was the number of trials there were looking at and analyzed finally, again there was a huge difference. One group using six trials, the other group only could finally use four trials. So this might be a little bit questionable. If you look now at the outcome or the results of this meta-analysis, and we look first at Phoenix trial, where they actually tried to see if PEEP improves mortality, but PEEP used as a part of a protective ventilator strategy means either vo tidal volume uh, limitation or reduction to relatively small tidal volumes or peak pressure limitation. Then you can show that this uh, meta-analysis shows uh, a clear benefit of PEEP, but just see again the number needed to treat is only 22, which means 21 out of 22 patients would not have shown a benefit. Uh, and then we take the other analysis where they looked at the use of PEEP as the only intervention, so no uh, combination with other lung protective strategies. The result is even worse. There was just one, uh, the number needed to treat was only 28. However, they conclude that actually PEEP should be used in this patient as a preferred ventilation mode in patients with severe ARDS. If we took now the other study, the Brow study, this study actually compared then patients with ARDS PEEP trials and uh, PEEP trials for patients without ARDS and could show a difference only for patients with ARDS as a diagnosis whereas not for the group without AIDS. Again, they recommend that higher level of PEEPs should be used in such patients. So the question comes now, how should we use then PEEP? And commonly we can say PEEP should provide enough height to recruit the recruitable alveoli while at the same time not applying so much PEEP that the health regions are unnecessarily overextended. So this would be the first concept. And the first concept you can see here in the schematic drawing actually shows that you may open up some area by increasing PEEP, but also you risk at the same time because you have associated tidal volume or pressure above PEEP setting that you may over distend some areas. And this is a little bit the hidden side uh, of the uh, PEEP uh, for PEEP titrations and increase of PEEP in your patients. And also we have to remember that lung aeration is something that happens in function of PEEP and disease pattern. And th this study from uh, Jean-Jacques Ruby actually shows this nicely. We take here two different patient types or at a CT with different CT attenuations of the lung disease. So on top we have a diffuse CT attenuation. You can see there is a lot of consolidation in this lung all over the place from uh, ventral to dorsal areas. Whereas in the other group or type of patient where we talk about the focal CT attenuations, we have collapse in the dorsal parts, so the dependent zones and uh, an open lung in the non-dependent ventral zones. And as you can see here, when increasing in both patient scenarios, the PEEP from zero to a stepwise increase of PEEP, then actually atelectasis for the focal seat attenuation patient was decreasing and the number of normal aerated areas was increasing. However, at higher PEEP, there was overdistension occurring. If you look then at the diffuse CT attenuation type patient, actually also there increasing PEEP reduced the amount of atelectasis as measured by Hounsfeld units, but only a very high PEEP allowed to start to have some areas normally opened. So from this observation we can conclude actually that not each patient can be treated and will benefit from the same PEEP level. So, um, Dr. Rimmensberger, that's a wonderful overview of the literature on PEEP and its effectiveness.
But I wonder if I could ask you, how do you use PEEP then? How do you think about it and interpret the literature as a practical matter at the bed space? Well, again, a difficult question, as usual. But uh, I think we should think not only in terms of PEEP, of providing enough PEEP to recruit and to avoid overextension. We have to take in account when we talk about PEEP, the associated tight volume, so the PEEP tight volume combination. Remembering that when you use high pressures above PEEP as an inspiratory pressure or high tidal volumes, the risk of overdistension is higher independent of the actual PEEP level. So maybe we can uh, explain this uh, with this uh, slide. Again, a very old study from Corbridge that actually was looking in, in animals depleted from surfactant by repeated lung washouts comparing ventilation at large tidal volumes with low PEEP and in the second group with smaller tidal volumes and high PEEP, focusing on both to attend to, to have the same plateau or peak pressure. So it's a combination of low tidal volume and high PEEP in one group and in the other group a large tidal volume and a low PEEP. And what they could show actually is that when looking at the amount of shunt, there was clear less shunt happening in the group ventilated with small tidal and high P, because as you have seen on the previous slide, they had actually a higher volume uh, benefit observed using uh, the, the high P, smaller tidal volume, despite resulting in the same high plateau pressure. And when looking then on uh, outcome after four hours of ventilation, there was a clear difference in terms of induced lung injury in the group using, or that was submitted to small tidal volume and high PEEP. There was a lower weight, a wet weight of body weight, so the indicator of edema formation, and there was also a lower amount of dry weight over uh, the body weight, which means as an indicator, which is the indicator of cellular infiltration. So small tight volume, high PEEP uh, confirmed or performed really better. We'd like to turn now to our colleagues around the world and ask you a question. Please first state your city and country location. The question is, how do you determine when you are over distending the lung? Dr. Grimmensberger, we often hear about the terms stress and strain. How are those defined? Um, and more importantly, or equally importantly, how do you think about the practical application of stress and strain at the bedside? So let's try to illustrate this. Uh, uh, I'll just take uh, this study, which was done in uh, animals, in, in mice, finally, and try to show you what strain can mean. So we have to think about strain as the change in length in reference to the initial length of, of the body. So distending from a, a starting point to a certain, certain end point. And this usually starting point to the end point is the tidal volume in our patients. So in this study, and they looked actually at the effect of the so-called global strain, so the overall distension of the lung, and tried to figure out if you uh, part, part, do a participation in dynamic strain and static strain, static strain given by a certain PEEP level, so the end expiry lung volume above FRC or functional reserve capacity, and then adding on top of this a tidal volume which will induce some dynamic strain. And in this study they did the maximum strain definition by distending these lungs to 2.5 of a basic strain, which means going up to total lung capacity. And what they could show that when increasing the static strain and on top reducing dynamic, dynamic strain, which is the tidal volume, that actually higher PEEP, lower tidal volume was resulting in less inflammatory response, as shown by the no increase in interleukin cysts in the bronchial lavage, no increase in lung water content, 
no changes in lung histology and also in these animals oxygenation was unchanged when ventilating them over uh, two hours with this approach. So the strain is the distending of the length from an initial uh, point and we can define it, define it finally as with the following formula. So strain is the tidal volume divided by the end expiratory volume which is on top of FRC. So it's FRC plus the so-called peak volume. And you can transform then this formula and say that the tide volume plus the peak volume, peak volume divided by the FRC gives you the idea of the inflated lung to functional mechanical residual capacity ratio. This is the strain exp expression. And I try to illustrate this with the schematic drawing. If you take a pressure volume curve of a normal lung compared to a sick restrictive lung, so in the normal lung you have usually a normal FRC, therefore you can use relatively low P because you still have recruited lung volume and you can use a tidal volume on top. Whereas in the sick lung where you have a reduced FRC, you also may have to use very small tidal volumes because as we discussed in the first session, we deal with a baby lung. There is still, uh, there is only a small residual lung volume available for ventilation. Which means in a normal lung, high FRC situation, you have a low strain condition, whereas in the sick lung, where you have a low FRC, you try to add some volume by adding a relatively high PEEP. You have a high risk situation for uh, inducing a high uh, strain to the patient and by this <coughs> uh, increasing the risk of lung injury. And this brings us back to what we discussed already in the first session also is about how can and should we recruit a lung. And this depends again how mechanics are in these lungs. We know that some patients recruit well, others recruit badly. And when looking at differences in the patients that recruit versus the no recruiters, we see that with adding the same pressure increase in terms of a sustained inflation, in one patient the lung volume changes, in the other one it doesn't and the same way. And this can be explained by looking at the effect of the transplanary pressure, the transplanary pressure being the airway pressure applied minus the intraperural pressure. So in a patient where we have a poor chest wall compliance, you're going to have less recruitment effect because the transplanary pressure will be lower and therefore the lung distending effect will be smaller. So what about then about stress? So stress is defined as the force per unit area. And it's exactly when you think about the patient, the force that we apply is the transpulmonary pressure on the lung. So it's the lung distending pressure. And so the stress is given by the airway pressure minus the pleural pressure, which corresponds to the transpulmonary pressure. Again, as we said before, whereas the strain is the change in length in relation to the initial lengths given by the tide volume plus the peak volume divided by FRC. Well, Peter, I wonder if I could turn now and ask you, um, you've just demonstrated uh, very clearly that uh, some patients respond to a sustained recruitment maneuver and others do not, and the importance of transpulmonary pressure. So the question becomes, um, how do you think about this in a practical sense at the bedside? Um, a sustained recruitment maneuver, a stepwise recruitment maneuver, and what are you looking for? Well, again, the, as I mentioned before, the important distending pressure is the transpalmary pressure. And because we do not have the possibility to measure it on a regular basis, there's just one ventilator on the market offering at the moment with some uh, variations in the measures you get, we ventilating like in a black box situation. Therefore, I do not think that it makes sense to do a sustained inflation in a patient because you never know if you have to go up to 20, 30, even 40 or 50 centimeters of airway pressure 
to reach a transponent pressure in this patient that will be sufficient to get to full total lung capacity in terms of a volume effect. So I prefer and strongly recommend to use PEEP titration by working us slowly up with small tidal volumes on top of this PEEP level. Because we learned from CT scans uh, from the Gattinoni group that to reach full recruitment, you have to bring up the lung to total lung capacity. And that's the reason I do not do so stay because I never know if with the pressure I apply, I reach total lung capacity because I do not know the transpalmy pressure. Uh, from classical understanding, we have to find a way how we can assess our stepwise recruitment at bedside. And one way is to look at the shape of the, the, the dynamic cycle in terms of dynamic compliance. We learned that if you have a low FRC condition with a lot of collapse, your dynamic compliance is low. When you start to move up along the pressure volume curve, then you see that you get more compliant, you come to more compliant areas. You need less pressure to deliver your tidal volume. And once you start to over this stent, then you see a flattening of this dynamic compliance because you are removing to the asymptote of the static pressure volume curve. This is possible and is one guidance we have at bedside. Another guidance is to look at the recruitment effect in terms of improving intrapalmary shunt, which means improving oxygenation. And when we look only at oxygenation in our patients, then we risk to go on very high pressures, and we still see an improving oxygenation, as shown by the group from Lichtwark Arschhoff, where they actually were using a animal model inducing severe ARDS and were increasing PEEP, keeping tidal volume stable by small steps of three centimeters from zero to 24 centimeters. And as you can see, the PF ratio, as indicated here, was improving even at very high pressures. When you look now at the other two lines you can see on this slide, you can see first dynamic compliance and you can see also auction delivery. And interestingly, at a certain point, auction delivery starts to drop down despite improving PF ratio, which clearly will indicate that we probably lose cardiac output in terms of uh, cardiac pump interactions. And when you look at the compliance curve, the compliance curve, as shown above in the sketch, actually starts to increase to a certain PEEP level, here up to 12, and then starts to drop down. So this clearly means that we recruit to the nadir of the uh, compliance curve. And when the compliance starts, curve starts to drop, despite further increasing in oxygenation, we probably have more over this tension than uh, recruitment effect in these lungs. The same has been shown by burns in patients where they actually were comparing two conditions, 6 mL per kilo of tidal and 10 mL per kilo of tidal volume. We're going to focus for the moment only on the 6 mL per kilogram bars. By increasing PEEP stepwise in these patients, they could show a clear improvement of oxygenation and even going from 20 to 25 of PEEP further increased oxygenation. But when looking at the compliance at each step, you can see that with 6 mL per kilogram, the compliance was improving to a point of a PEEP of 15 and was dropping down afterwards. When they then used 10 mL per kilogram as a tidal volume, the same drop in compliance was observed at lower PEEP. And that's important question brings us back to the question of strain. It's the question, the combination of PEEP and tide volume and how to combine this the best. We have a, another hint in the literature by a group from Black, where they looked at different PEEP settings the same way, but were adding to the oxygenation response and the compliance response expressed as the peak-to-peak the, the, the -peak, uh, pressures, so the, the difference between the PEEP and the plateau pressures as an indicator of worsening compliance when going up. They added also 
the PCA2 level, showing on volume control that it's despite not changing minute ventilation, the CO2 was going down when they were recruit, recruiting, and as soon as they started to overdistend, CO2 levels started to increase. So when we bring this together, I can try to show you here a slide we created years ago in the animal lab, where we actually had a, an animal with severe ARDS after surfactant washout, so a highly recruitable lung condition. When ventilating these animals with a PEEP of 10 increasing to 15, 20, 25, keeping on top the delta pressure the same at each level, then we could observe an improving oxygenation and even going with a PEEP from 25 and higher, oxygenation was still improving as measured here with the interarterial uh, direct catheter measurements, so a sensor that we had within the, the blood of this, uh, or the arterial blood of this animal. And when we look then at the CO2 response, the CO2 was stable for the first part of PEEP steps, and when we increased the PEEP to 25, we saw a sudden so a rapid increase in CO2, means clearly indicating that overdistension started there despite improved oxygenation. So how can we explain this? Let's use as, uh, this uh, sketch from uh, uh, Gattinoni, where you actually can see even I increase with my PEEP the lung volume, leading to recruitment of some collapsed areas. Then we end up with an improving oxygenation. But when the same PEEP at the same time causes in the uh, upper, the ventral parts of a distension, then we may create a national dead space, and this will be indicated by an increase of CO2. So looking at dynamic compliance, CO2 and oxygenation at bedside during stepwise increase of PEEP might be helpful to detect over distension. And I just tried to illustrate this. If you don't have a arterial blood gas, you may perhaps use a transcutane CO2 monitoring, as you can show here, where we had a patient increasing PEEP in steps of 2 from 6, 8, 10 to 12. When we increased the PEEP from 6 to 8, we saw a small increase in oxygenation. When going higher up to 10, 12, nothing happened in terms of further oxygenation improvement. But we see, when we look carefully at this slide, that actually CO2 starts slowly to rise at 10 and clearly rises at 12 of PEEP. So bedside direct monitoring might be helpful, not only in, in full numbers, but when we're looking at trends in relation to our ventilator settings. We'd like to turn now to our colleagues around the world and ask you a question. Please first state your city and country location. The question is, how do you wean PEEP? Do you wean based on an FiO2 level, or chest x-ray lung volumes, or some other variable? So, to go one step further, we have to understand lung opening and closing. We were talking so far of going up with the PEEP levels, but we have learned that it's not only recruiting and pushing up the PEEP levels, because there's a high risk of overdistension, that we have to think about getting down the PEEP levels as soon as we have reached some recruitment. And again, this can be nicely shown uh, by uh, this slide, where you can see that when increasing your pressures, the lungs open at a certain pressure here, around 8 centimeters of water. Going further down up with the pressures, increases recruitment is opening up, and you have to open up the lung at total lung capacity. When now from this point we start to come down with our pressures, then we see that the lung remains open to very low pressures here, down to four centimeters of water, and that collapse occurs only below. So we have during inflation when going up a clear area where we recruit the lung, and when coming down at much lower pressures, it's only there where the recruitment happens. And this has been shown actually in old physiology papers already before, by Fraser, for example, where he could show that closing, once the lung is open, happens at very low pressures. 
Similar to this, there is a study out from Gattinoni's group, again from Silvana Cropti. They looked at ARDS patients and were recruiting them with increasing PEEP and were trying to, to follow the, the signs of uh, opening by looking at CT scans, serial CT scans, and you can see that in these ARDS patients, the mean pressure needed to open as a PEEP level was around 20 centimeters of water. Once these lungs were open, this patient had good oxygenation response on CT scan, a clear indicator that the lungs were open. They could reduce these PEEP levels down to four to six centimeters of water before in most of them closing happened. So there is clear indicator that even in patients, there is lung hysteresis. Therefore, I think we have to do slow PEEP titration to go up and down to explore the lung behavior. And we have discussed before, each patient may behave differently. This we had learned from high frequency oscillation years ago by the study from Brazelton's and uh, John Arnold's group, where they actually compared lung volumes as measured by uh, respiratory impedance platysmography compared to oxygenation response and could show that actually instead of a pressure volume curve, you could actually uh, design a pressure oxygenation curve. And the same happens during conventional ventilation. This has become clear since we use smaller tidal volumes. Then actually we have to work you up with uh, PEEP levels at small tide valves to recruit the lung, and then you can slide down on the deflation limb to very low PEEP levels, maintaining still good lung volumes and oxygenation. So for example here, when we hook up a patient to a, to a ventilator, poor oxygenation, let's choose a PEEP level of, of 15 centimeters of water. You can see that when just having hooked him up and ventilating, his oxygenation will probably be poor because we are low, low, low lung volumes. Working us up and coming down and going back to the same PEEP level of 15, now we work at a much higher lung volume level, which will be testimony by a better oxygenation. But you also can see that the tidal cycle got steeper, which means the lungs got much more compliant. And this will be also reflected then in improved oxygenation. Similarly, this has been shown in the lab as in other studies in patients that when you have the possibility to have a CT scan at bedside, that actually during a fast recruitment going up with pressures as this group did here in animals to total lung capacity, stepwise increase of PEEP, keeping the tidal volumes on top the same, and then sliding down with PEEP steps slowly on the deflation part, they could show that lung collapse started to occur at the area about 12 to 10 centimeters of PEEP level, which is testimony by an occurrence of uh, CT areas there lost their aeration. They compared this to the oxygenation response, and you can see, as indicated here, that actually the oxygenation start to drop slowly before they could observe the first uh, real dropping of lung volumes uh, in the CT scans. And when we take now as the last information, the bedside measured compliance, we can see that the point where oxygenation starts to drop, at the point where lung starts to collapse, we are just at the point where we have the best compliance situation during the descending peep steps. And this may help us at bedside. So maybe to summarize, optimal PEEP, optimal ventilation means that we have to find in each patient the place of maximum dynamic compliance, where we can maintain good oxygenation at the least pressures required. So this means if we take a patient, we have it probably is a poor oxygenation, high CO2 because he's low compliant at low pressures, his dynamic compliance is low, we have to move us up slowly, stepwise with PEEP levels. When we start to see an improving oxygenation, we probably will see that CO2 drops a little bit if dynamic compliance increases because we are recruiting. This is usually quite modest as an effect.
And then at some point, we're going to observe that oxygenation improves, but if CO2 starts to rise or dynamic compliance starts to drop, that's a warning sign, which means we are close or we are close to hyperinflation over this tension and we should drop back. We at bedside, we also, also use a drop in the systolic blood pressure as an indicator of possible overindication. Now, it's the point not to stay there, but to work you down. Our descending peep steps sliding down on the deflation limb, and you're going to observe that the oxygenation stays stable. The CO2 comes down because we go now in very compliant areas. And at some point, you will see that oxygenation starts to drop, which means now we are collapsing again, and you would have to do the recruitment once more and keep then the peep level just slightly above the point where you observed oxygenation starting to drop. So this means optimal lung expansion, the most homogeneous one adapted to the lung pathology as your best, best oxygenation and ventilation. Well, Peter, that's a wonderful review of the literature and the pressure volume curves that you showed illuminate the concepts that you're discussing very well. But at the bedside, we often struggle with pressure volume loops. And ideally, we'd like to see them uh, provide as much clarity at the bedside as they do explaining these concepts. And yet, it's often difficult to see the change in compliance in these pressure volume loops for an actual patient at the bedside. How do you use pressure volume loops in this setting with a real patient at the bedside? Well, first a caveat. What you see on your ventilator is a dynamic pressure volume curve, and it's not a static pressure volume curve. This means this dynamic curve gives you the range of the pressure volume relationship during your dynamic cycle. And this has clearly nothing to do with an opening or closing of your lungs because you cannot display the overall static pressure volume curve from FRC to total lung capacity. It just situates you what the ventilator does at some point within this pressure volume envelope of your respiratory system. And often it's a trend there to use a change in curvature of the inflation limb of this pressure volume curve as an indicator to set PEEP. However, this is very tricky and should not be done for the following reason. Uh, this has been shown by the group from Carison, where they actually put a pressure transducer down to the carina level and were tracing pressure changes during mechanical ventilation at this level compared to the airway pressure we measure outside at the level of the endotracheal tube connector. And comparing this pressure volume curve generated from the Y-piece loop versus the trachea loop, they could show that they look completely different. And as you can see up here, that actually the pressure volume curve measured at the YP was indicating a change in curvature at the pressure level of about uh, 10 centimeters of water. Whereas the, the for pressure volume loop measured at the tracheal level, at the carina level, did not show this change in curvature. So why this difference? This difference is because we have a high resistive element between the Y-piece and the trachea, which is the endotracheal tube. And since you have a continuous inflation, it's not a very low flow inflation, you're going to see the effect of resistance that actually is indicating you some wrong messages, which means, or which often say, that's the opening pressure. So this is, be careful. Now, nowadays, ventilator companies tell you, well, that's not a problem for us. We can uh, change the alg algorithms. We have all the mathematical knows, knowing, physical knowing. We can do and generate right curves. This may work in some specific conditions. However, as you can see on this slide here, the, actually the measured uh, PV curve on the tracheal level compared to the measured one with an correcting algorithm on, compared with the uh, ETT tube measured, airway measured uh, pressure volume pump, look, all, this, all the three look different. 
virus because in this situation they put a little bit of gel in the endotracheal tube, but this was an endotracheal tube of an adult size, so an ETT7 size, and we have to realize that this changes resistance within the tube, and this the machine cannot take in account when doing these corrections by the algorithms programmed. So what is the correlate to the ETT gel? That's a little bit of liquidity, a little bit of mucus that can be in your endotracheal tube. So again, be careful, your curves can change all the time and therefore they are very difficult to, to get a real interpretation at bedside. The only way or the only reason that you might look at this curve in my opinion is when you look at the upper end. In the upper end, if you see a flattening of the curve, this may indicate that you start to over distend the lung at the end of inspiration. And that's something we want to look carefully for. Certainly when you start to increase your PEEP level, remember that your peak pressure or a, the, the plateau pressure goes up at the same time. And classically it is used as the C20 over C dynamic ratio. So the C20 indicating the compliance of the last part, so the last 20% of the pressure range of the dynamic cycle. And this value is then compared to the overall dynamic compliance the ventilator is measuring during the dynamic cycle. However, there's a little bit of difficulty in these numbers because the different manufacturers do not have, do not apply the same algorithms and basics on how to calculate. So this line is drawn of the C20 as the C in, not by all the companies the same way. And in my experience, having three ventilators side by side in the same condition does not give you always the same number. So I would be careful in taking a value of 0 0.8 as a clear indicator of over distension. I would uh, much more look just at the shape of the curve. So maybe we can summarize how should we set PEEP. We should set PEEP in a titrating way and the only goal is to restore FRC. So there is no single PEEP level that fits all my patients. Slow PEEP titration up and down is required to explore individual patient's response. So sustained inflation at a given pressure for a certain time will, is not very thoughtful and may in, induce in some patients severe overdistension in other patients is not enough to distend the lung because we do not know how much the transplant pressure will be and we do also not know how much stress we will induce to this lung and cause lung injury already by this kind of maneuvers. Recruiter maneuvers in the attempt to improve severe oxygenation failure by slow incremental and temperamental PEEP steps can be suggested, as I said, not by sustained inflation maneuvers. And before initiating a recruiter maneuver, I would come back on the question of strain and strongly suggest to use the smallest tidal volume you can allow in such a patient. The patient that has poor oxygenation has normally quite a lot of intrapulmonary shunt, means some collapsed recruitable or non-recruitable area. So he is in a baby lung condition and therefore using small tidal volumes is important and makes all the maneuvers more safe. Well, Dr. Peter Remsberger, uh, Director of Neonatal and Pediatric Intensive Care at University Hospital in Geneva, we thank you for sharing your expertise over these uh, two series. These are going to be very valuable for our colleagues around the world. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, that was a great pleasure.